Hello. Hello, welcome. Um, welcome to a conversation with two key documentarians, Glenn Friedman and Ian Mackay. A huge thanks to David Quick and DCPL for putting this together, as well as the AV staff. Thank you, guys. Can we give them a hand? Thank you. Um, thank you. As well as the DC Punk Archive, which if you haven't been, it's located on the fourth floor. There's a punk and go-go exhibit, so if you get a chance, check it out um, after this. Uh, my name is Carlos Isrieta, and I'm with the Friends of the Mount Pleasant Library. Uh, the Friends are, of the Library are an all-volunteer group that advocates for each public library branch, as well as raises funds through book sales and t-shirts. Let me introduce our two speakers. First up is Glenn Friedman, who's from Los Angeles, California, and is a world-renowned photographer who chronicled the iconic Dogtown skateboarders, as well as the meteoric rise of skateboarding in the United States, as well as all over the world. Glenn was also a key documentarian of the storied early LA and NYC punk scenes, as well as the golden age of hip hop, capturing the spirit of the time through vivid and now iconic images. Our second guest, Ian Mackay, is a native Washingtonian who co-owns co a label called Discord Records, that has been documenting local DC punk and indie bands since 1980. The label included many of his own bands, like the Teen Idols, Minor Threat, and Fugazi, who, went, who all went on to shape and influence countless bands through their music, lyrics, and socio-political actions. Ian has also documented over 800 live Fugazi shows that happened between 1987 and 2003. These experiences have led to Ian talking about experiences as a record label owner, band member, and archivist everywhere from universities to the Library of Congress here in DC. He will be leading the conversation about Glenn's new book, What I See. Welcome. Can we stand? Yeah, we yeah, stand? We can do that. I'm much better at that. Leave Good. the microphone here. Can everyone hear us okay? All Hello? Right. Uh, we're gonna stand, if you all don't mind. It's a little easier. Yeah, maybe we'll sit eventually. All right, I'll move uh, my I back. I like this to hold their microphone for me. Um, I, I want to start by saying that um, I've known Glenn for many, many years. I first met Glenn on uh, December 26, 1981, uh, Bad Brains, um, The Faith, and who else was on that bill that day? I don't know. I was think... it CBGB's? Yeah. I'd gone up to New York. Did you go this Tommy, on that show? Um, we drove up. <laughs> Drove to New York, uh, and of course, <clears throat> thing about Glenn was, as a skateboarder in the 70s, I knew, like we all knew Glenn Friedman. We knew Glennie Friedman, the photographer, because he had all these seminal photos, especially involved with the Dogtown skateboard scene in the mid-70s, and the punk kids here, a lot of the people who later on became more known in the punk scene, before we were in the punk, we were skateboarders. So we knew his work, and then, um, when I, I remember when I got into um, punk, which would have been very tail end of 78, um, and then when I first saw my first show, which would have been the beginning of 79, uh, I remember thinking like, well, punks and skateboarders, you can't do both, right? That's the way at the time it felt like, because the punk people I knew thought skateboarders were ridiculous, and the skateboarders just thought punks were like disgusting, and didn't, they were just like more like rock and roll like kind of dudes or something so I think that was the east coast thing it might have been east coast yeah, because California, the thing was they were all mixed pretty well well maybe maybe, a little, maybe we got to that point let's but, start some controversy right now but we're not starting a controversy <laughs> yet but so the thing was that we um so for me I was like well I'm interested in there's the, Joe and Ant all right there oh, yeah, we're there looking are. for them the whole time um, sorry about that I'm super interested stop fucking in our sorry me, please <laughs> you gotta damn. get used to it after all these years um, you know right, that's so, how it goes um so I was <clears throat> Like, I got into punk and kind of gave up on skateboarding in, the, in sort of the more general sense. I still skateboarded. But then I started seeing people like Steve Olson, Dwayne Peters, Tony Alva, people who I knew as skateboarders who then cut their hair. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, now this is punk. Like, it's like they're going punk, too. And it was super exciting. And we started seeing photos in magazines from Glenn. Glenn E. Friedman was taking photos of Black Flag and... Um, you did the adolescence cover. Uh, so it was super exciting to know that there was these kids on the West Coast who were like also skateboarders who started getting into punk thing, which it felt really validating in a way. And then 
Rollins, <clears throat> who was also on my skateboard team, he was Henry Garfield at the time, in, in the summer of 1981, uh, he got Black Flag asked him to join. So I drove him to the Greyhound bus station just over here, dropped him off. He went to Detroit, and that was the end of Henry. He went off to L.A., but he met Glenn early on when you got out there. In fact, Glenn has photos of one of Henry's very first shows. Um, and he said, like, oh, I met Glennie Friedman. I remember, like, he was, we were really excited about it because this guy was a hero. So then, uh, oh, nice. I don't know when you first wrote me, but was it before or after that we met? I don't know. I wrote you. I think I, we had met, but yeah. then, and I didn't, I wasn't, you know, up on enough to recognize the greatness of the first record. But when the second record came out, I wrote well, the, you. He's about so Meyer records. Yeah. He didn't recognize the greatness of the first record. Yeah. Yeah. I just he didn't. He should, but he should have. But, yep. uh, but when the second one came around, I was able to reevaluate and see where I made right. my mistakes. And, right. you know, yeah. I could do that. I could still do that. But anyway, it was amazing to meet him. And then we basically have remained best friends ever since. Um, when Glenn, <clears throat> over the years, he's worked on a lot of projects. I've always been sort of um, kind of like in a consultant of sorts. This you know? is true. Um, we have differing opinions, but we both know how to swing them at each other. Uh, and then when this Black Flag book came up, I mean, of course, I knew about Glenn's photos, and I think they're amazing. Uh, and the reason I think they're so amazing is that they really specifically capture a certain era of Black Flag in which I really felt like they were the game changers uh, in underground music. Um, Black Flag went on, you know, for a few years, and things got a little bit complicated, you know, a little sordid. Um, but the first few years were pretty unimpeachably incredible in terms of just how much work they did to create something that never existed before. And what I mean by that, and I'll be specific, is that, <clears throat> and that, this is a very sh thumbnail, th thumbnail history about the American uh, underground punk hardcore scene, is that scenes were popping up all over the country. I think when the, especially when the British punk thing happened, it sent up like a flare that basically said self-definition, right? It said self-definition, self-defined. So people all over the country were like, yeah, fucking self-defined. Go, like, become, make something of yourself. And we would just look at these pictures, listen to the records, and try to figure out how to do it on our own. So you had scenes showing up. Obviously in Los Angeles had an incredible early punk scene. San Francisco had a scene. Um, uh, uh, Austin, Texas had an amazing scene. Um, then you had Reno, Nevada. You had all these little, uh, Boston, all these cities, these, these bands would pop up. But we didn't really, we weren't really connected to each other. The first band, I think, that really connected that super underground was DOA. And DOA from Vancouver, they were, those, those people were so committed to like going out and playing that they would just go anywhere and play. I can tell you, for instance, I got a call once from those guys, and they said, hey, we're in New York, can we come play a show in D.C.? And we said, well, we're doing like a free show at a high school cafeteria, and they're like, okay, we'll come down. And they played at H.B. Woodlawn in Arlington, which was insane, and we just passed a hat. I have a recording of people walking around going like, can you spare a few coins for DOA? You know, that's the, so they were really committed. They were committed to playing, and they had a manager who had been involved, um, I, th I think he was involved with um, the Revolutionary Communist Party, but sort of underground, left-wing, the yippie movement, and he had connection all around the country, um, including Madam's Organ, which was a commune on 18th Street, not the bar by the same name, not that one, it was across the street, it's where the, um, there's a cookie shop there now or something, it's our townhouse, do you know, do you know where it is, what's that cookie shop, you know Tommy? In Zambia, right. That used to be Madame's organ. That was the commune. And they, DOA played there uh, October 31st, 1979. I was sick. I'm still regretting that day. But my brother was there. And you can see pictures of that show, from that show, in Lucian Perkins' book, Hard Art, which is an, a, a beautiful book. Um, they were friends with Black Flag. So those guys went around the country. They found all these weird little locations. Then Black Flag went to Vancouver. They met Chuck Dukowski, the bass player of Black Flag, was, he was a visionary. And he just went, sat down with the DOA people and said, give me all your numbers. And then Black Flag just went to town. They started touring so hard, they would go out and do one loop, and they'd get back and they'd do a second B loop, playing every other city, the city they didn't play the first time. So they were a really, they really led 
like the charge in terms of really developing a network. The first Meyer Threat Tours that I ever did, the numbers I had, I got from Chuck Dukowski from Black Flag. He gave me all the numbers. So, and that I gave, we used to print up sheets of numbers of like gigs, and then people would say, we just print them up, and we just, people say, do you have numbers? They'd say, yeah, here, here's, here are numbers. And so that was how the network would develop. So Black Flag was a super important band, and seeing photos from Glenn, knowing the kind of connection to the LA skateboarding thing, and then finally meeting him, that friendship just developed. And when this book started, I remember thinking like, these photos are so powerful and so strong, so let's, I was really happy to be a part of it, and that's why we're here today. Yeah. That's what I have to say. Are, that, are we done now? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I never before had someone officially, Ian's helped me with all my projects, as he says, he's a confidant, I always show him everything, but I said, you know, on this book in particular, you know, I wanted him to be my editorial assistant, and that's the credit he has in the book. He really helped me, we went over almost every page together, and, and there was definitely some spreads in the book when we talk about some specific stuff that I wasn't even going to use, and Ian's like, well, you have to use that, and he would explain to me why, you know, because, you know, I've seen all the pictures, I took over four years I made 900 exposures of Black Flag, that, you know, just 900 pictures. Not 900 good ones, just that was it, beginning to end, 900. And we made a 254-page book. I think it's a pretty good percentage. And, um, and yeah, to, just to, and, and I had seen them so many times for so many years that, you know, you just, you look at them the same way, you know, for a while, and then eventually it changes how it looks, right? But then you have another set of eyes on it, and you get to see other things. I mean, even, sometimes even when you see something on the screen, when it's blown up bigger on the page in the book, you say, oh, I didn't see that guy jumping off the balcony or something in the background, you know? And it's, uh, you know, you see all these different things all the time. So, uh, that was, yeah, that was, that was quite a project. It was kind of like a COVID thing in a way, too, right? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I suppose yeah, we were was, doing yeah. that, you know, and, and I was working on the little Dogtown short movie and other things at the same time. We, all right. We made use of that time, but, uh, yeah, and then, you know, here we are, and uh, I don't know where to go from here, but you want to... Yeah, read? so this photo right here, that's, that's Black Flag with Dez singing. Where is that show? Is that... This is at the Starwood, and this is like the second time I ever shot them. I, I shot them one other time before this, and I had met them after the show the first time I shot them. It was in East L.A. at the Vex, but this show, I was allowed to sit on the stage. I was like right there in front of the monitors with the band, and, you know, had kind of, you know, not that anyone couldn't back then, but, you know, I didn't want to get in the way. I was pretty shy, and I would just... In a way, you know, I mean, I would just, but, you know, want to stay out of the way. And, yeah, I'd, this picture was in Action Now magazine. It was used a lot. And this was one of my first pic really great pictures, I thought, where you really see, you know, the guys in the band and you see Dez singing. What year is that? This is 1980, I'd say. 80. That'd be yeah, 80. Yeah, at the Starwood. At the beginning, I think it's January. No, no, it, maybe it's December 80. I think. What did, when did Henry join the band? Was it 81? June 81. June 81. That's right. And the first gig was August. That's right. Yeah. yeah. August 21st. So, yeah. So, this was earlier. It was late 1980 or early 81, yeah. And the Starwood was sort of a seminal L.A. punk venue that we'd all had read about or heard about um, here in Washington. As I said, the kids in Washington, a lot of us were extremely interested, and we felt a real affinity to the L.A. punk scene. That was really, really important to us. And like, I think when you grow up in town and you're here... Like, everyone's like, I'm going to move to New York. I want to move to New York. And after a while, we're like, yeah, you know, fuck New York. We're not, you know, like, and so, and then, and then people are saying like, oh, well, you know, you're not, you know, you can't be a punk. If, you don't, if you're a punk, you got to move to New York. But first off, we were in high school. We're not moving to New York. So we're, so, so that mean we can't be a punk because we're in high school. So I think, again, like the self-defined sort of uh, message was like, well, we're just going to make our own, we make our own scene here, right? But we started hearing about these, these bands in LA, like really early bands, like the Danger House scene, which was like bands like um, the Avengers or um, the Eyes, the Randoms, uh, Alley Weirdos, Cats, Alley Beats. Cats, the Bags. Like these bands, there was this label called Danger House, which was super uh, influential. It had a huge inspiration on me. So we just saw like that, their aesthetic, it was so, the, the way the records looked was so beautiful um, and it just seemed so thought out, like everything was from LA, and I thought, that's what labels are supposed to be. They're supposed to document that particular scene. And if you think about it, that's exactly what Discord, that's the mission with it from the day one was like, we're gonna document a scene here in Washington, so people say, if it's in Discord, oh, that's some DC shit, right? Which I think was really, I thought all the labels were gonna just do that forever, but that didn't end up being the case at all. You know, I think we're the only label that really stuck it out. Um, but Danger House was, so we really, um, 
fell in love with the L.A. punk scene to the degree that when I played bass in the Teen Idols, the first time that Teen Idols ever played outside of Washington, D.C. was in Los Angeles. We took a Greyhound bus four days <laughs> to play at the Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong Cafe. We got there. We just, we had... In San I Francisco. Was, no, no. Oh, Hong the Hong Kong. Kong. Oh, oh, I thought Hong you were talking Kong. about Mabuhay. No, Sorry. Mabuhay. No, yeah. this is Hong Kong. Yeah. So there was... We had four, there's four of us in two roadies, Henry Garfield slash Rollins and Mark Sullivan, right? We went all the way across the country. We brought two roadies and all we brought was a bass, a guitar, and a pair of drumsticks. So I think the roadies were really just because we all wanted to go to LA, right? And, um, and we got all the way there. We assumed, because that's the way it worked here, that you would just, yeah, of course, just use our gear. But when we got there, said, so whose gear are we going to use? And they, they're like, you're not using our fucking gear. There's no way, you know. <laughs> so we had to do some negotiating. We played with Vox Pop, um, the Mentors, which for those of you who know, that was a weird bill, and a band called Puke Spit and Guts. And the only thing I can tell you about is Puke Spit and Guts is they were some, some out, well, out in like the desert, and their record between every song was just the sounds of chainsaws and babies screaming. <laughs> um, and... Uh, <laughs> Look that record up. It's insane. So were we were horrible. on that bill. We, we went out there and we were on that bill. We made that night $15. And then we took a Greyhound bus up to San Francisco. We played Mabuhay Gardens and we made $11. So, but it was so worth it because that was really, we, like, we, and we were so inspired by what we met kids out there and we're like all right this is the scene and we spent a lot of time trying to find black flag we knew that they were out there and we couldn't we couldn't find them but we did see the circle jerks up in san francisco and then i met that's when i met keith, keith morris who was the first singer of black flag you never saw keith did you, did you not sing? singing with yeah. black flag no i don't think many people did i think no. that was only about less than six months so oh let me this this photo sorry this photo right I, here i could tell them oh you do yeah go ahead <laughs> But really, I use this photo only because Ian told me to. I was never a person who photographed, like, the scene. I didn't shoot pictures of people's boots. I didn't shoot pictures of people hanging out on the side, you know, with their friends. I shot pictures of people who were inspiring me. I was wanting to shoot pictures, you know, like you see on the cover of the book of Henry. I wanted people who were inspiring me to inspire other people. This other stuff I thought was creepy. Older photographers would shoot it. Younger other photographers would shoot it. But this one in particular was kind of interesting because, you know, you had to check your chains before you went into the show, right? At, at the, and, it, and I think this was actually at the first Black Flag show that I photographed them at. I had seen them before I had ever photographed them. That's, I usually do that. I usually see a band. If I like them, I'll go back and bring my camera next time. I, most of the time I went to see shows, I did not bring my camera. I didn't want to be a camera nerd. It just, I didn't want to do that. And, but when it was needed, when I wanted to, you know, spread this inspiration, I would bring my camera. But this was such an odd thing, I just had to take a picture of it. And so when we're going through the proof sheets, I show it to Ian. I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm going to use it as a filler in between a couple other pictures. He said, are you kidding me? And tell him why you wanted us to use that no, one. I said, that's a double spread right there. That's the, that's, look at that photo. It's incredible. And it's also, I mean... I just want to know if people actually paid to check their chains. Or, you know, like, did they? No, I think they just took it from them. <laughs> it's amazing. Like, who brings chains to shows? I guess a lot of people. 1980, that, yeah. was, that was a fashion statement. That's what yeah. people did, and I think also for protection, maybe, you know? There was a kid here that used to come to shows wearing plastic garden chain, just a white plastic garden chain. <laughs> that had a message. That was his version. Yeah. Here had, in DC. had his message. Yeah. Um, all right. That's Rollins, that's Rollins, it was one of his first shows, right? Yep, and that's me in the front row taking pictures of him, trying to. I think the cover of that book, the, the, you know, the, new, the book that you guys have, that was taken that day. This is, you know, that's the camera, that's me, there's Henry. He, does, you know, he does, doesn't have too many tattoos yet. I think one. all he, had, all he had was the bars at that time, and he just got them like a week or two before, I mm -hmm. think, something like that. And that was at the Cuckoo's Nest, and it was a, there was a double bill. They were, I mean, they played twice. They played a matinee and a later show. I think I just shot the matinee. I don't remember which one I shot. Yeah, actually, yeah, because in the book also, I took pictures in between the two shows. I got some pictures of uh, portraits of the band in the back. And again, I had already known them by this point a little bit because, uh, you know, as Dukowski writes, you know, I had met them and they knew me because of Skateboarder Magazine as well. So they kind of gave me, you know, privilege to do what I want and to shoot what I want because they all appreciated that. And yeah, and they were amazing. I mean, it, you know, I had seen Black Flag with Dez, which I think was really, the period when Dez was in the band, I think is when they really solidified their reputation. I mean, all the stuff that everyone hears about Black Flag with the police 
and um, you know, and you know, and the riots at the shows and stuff. That was really mostly happened in Los Angeles during the Des era. I mean, it was really, I mean, you know, police, full battalions of police closing down streets and and you know, and beating up kids and you know, arresting kids and uh, you know, and riots with you know, police car windows broken, all that stuff. I think by the time Henry was in the band, that wasn't happening as much, you know, not in Los Angeles. They were certainly being, uh, you know, surveillance was on the band, um, but, but the gigs, they weren't even allowed to play in Los Angeles as much anymore. Um, and, uh, but you know, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but I would just. I'll just say that, you know, Henry changed his name when he, got, when he joined oh. the band. Tukowski said, you should probably change your last name you know, change your name because, you know, just make it harder for the police because, like, the cops were really, they were really bothering. They would, you know, really hassle every Black Flag show early on. So that's, and, and let me just yeah. say, what I was going to no. say is that even though so much of the reputation was made in those dead, Des years, you know, or Des months, it's probably around 18 months, I think it was probably Singer, when Henry came, it's like you saw him and that was it. It's like, you know, people who were around in the old days and saw Keith or Ron or even Des, oh, fuck Henry, he's not, you know, he's just a jock or whatever, and they didn't like him. But really, if you were open-minded and you just saw him with that band, I mean, obviously, you could see for the years he lasted with the band, he was incredible. And I mean, in this day, I think Robert Hilburn was there, you know, who was a big uh, music writer at the time, and everyone was just blown away. I mean, Henry just brought it, like, really incredibly. It was, it was just phenomenal. And I mean, and the thing was, too, is like, Ian mentions when, when, uh, when Henry came to LA and he said that he had met me, I met him at, a, there was this hangout called Oki Dogs that everyone used to go to and I see Henry sitting there and I just met him that summer before, earlier in that summer in New York, selling SOA seven inch records. You know, he was selling his record at the shows and I'm like, what are you doing out here? And he's like, said, I'm Black Flag's new singer. Yeah. I'm like, what, you're the guy? You know, because we had heard, because everyone knew they were looking for a new singer. And uh, yeah, and then how was I to know that he was going to come out and be this powerhouse that he was? And uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing, continuing the inspiration. And I mean, no one poured it out like that guy. Who it's, took this photo? What? Who took the photo? Uh, this photo was taken by... Um, was it the For Yous guy? For Yous, yeah. That's, so there's this guy named... They go by For Yous, him and his uh, girlfriend who's cropped out of this picture, unfortunately, but she was to the side there. They used to take photographs of the LA scene, and rather than putting out a fanzine, they would make these mini posters, and they would just hand them out to people at shows. He, this wasn't one of the posters, but he actually had other photos from that night, and, he, and when I told him I was looking for something, I saw that he had photographed it. He sent me this picture. I'm like, this is great. This would be great for the book. You know, I, don't, I didn't even see it until you know, a year before, you know, in the last couple of years. It was pretty cool when little gems like this come up. Yep, super cool. Um, and I can, I'll tell you that we all, here in Washington, we all knew Black Flag was looking for a new singer as well. And Henry and I, you know, we worked at the Hagen dazs Ice Cream Shop, we worked at the Georgetown Movie Theater. He was in SOA, I was in Meyer Threat. You know, like, one thing I should say about the Georgetown Movie Theater, like, I worked there Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Henry worked there Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And there was one kid who could work only on Sundays. And that was it, that was the Usher staff. So if there's a show, who was going to play or what order the bands were going to play depending on what night it was because like someone had to work. It was either me or Henry. So it would always be like, okay, well, because that's why in Meyer Threat, like if you look at Meyer, uh, SOA's, I think Meyer Threat played every show SOA ever played, Meyer Threat played on except for the last one, which was with Black Flag um, in Philadelphia. But so we were all, we were in constant contact with each other. So we were really interested. We were huge Black Flag fans. They had come to Washington. They stayed at my, my family house. I still lived at home. They stayed for a few days. We all hung out with them. Like we were all on the phone with them all the time. I used to, you know, we'd just call them up and talk. And so we were really curious to see who there was going to be their new singer because Dez wanted to play guitar. And I remember actually I was at Cynthia's house one day, Cynthia Connolly, um, and I got, I you know, got a phone call from Henry at the house, and I and. And he said, oh, did you hear who's singing for Black Flag? I'm like, no, who, who? And he goes like, me. <laughs> and I was like, I said, what? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he says, me. I said, what, the, what do you mean you? And he had secretly gone up to New York and tried out for them. They had said, why don't you come up and sing it? Some, I did think they did, first see him when they played in Philadelphia with SOA? Is that no, the that wasn't the first. No, no, no. That, they'd already asked him that point. Really? So oh, he yeah, did no, another he show to, he knowing he was going to sing. He was at, I think, A7. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, did yeah, a gig yeah. or something, a late night, like five yeah. in the morning show, and he sang, he got and did clocked in, and then he got in his car and drove straight back to Washington because he had to open the ice cream shop in Georgetown. So 
So he was, and, I, and then I was like, you're going to sing? And he says, yeah. And he says, but should I? I go, yeah. I mean, yeah, you have, your choices are to manage haagen or go sing for Black Flag. <laughs> go. Um, <laughs> Little did he know, he'd certainly make a lot more money in doing, working at haagen That's true, at Black that Flag. point, yeah, because Black Flag did not, he never got paid a dime. I don't know if you know that. But I think Black they got Flag. $5 a day. Yeah, per diem, that's true. But that was it. They didn't get... But that was it for life, just yeah. $5 a day. Yeah. That's all they lived on. But, um, so it was really exciting and also totally shocking like when that happened and then so he would I have all these letters from him and he would call me and would just tell me all like oh I met so and so and I went to like went to Okie Dogs you're a you know, mythical location so um, it was again really exciting to um, kind of get this back door sort of view and actually I, I will say that when Black Flag started to tour with Henry he was like Johnny Appleseed for the DC scene. And I, you know, not recently, in the last few years, I did a project where I archived all my correspondence. And I have, so I went through every letter I had saved, which is like 40 years of letters, and have it all organized in, you know, different collections now. But I started seeing like all these letters saying, oh, I heard about your scene from Henry. And like, and there's, I mean, I mean, maybe hundreds of them. And I was like, wow, Henry was really out there talking up the scene, which was kind of amazing. I think, you know, really, I, I, I never had thought about what I said. Where the fuck did this guy come from? But yeah, well, I think that when they, I remember when he went to LA, he said that people there were like, who is this guy? Yeah. And then they wanted to fight him all the time. It's like, the, like <laughs> you know, he, had, he got into a lot of scraps with people out there because I think there was like, well, we're going to see whether you're tough enough. But I think he was tough enough. No doubt. Um, uh, I mean, that's... That's, you, that's you don't have to, yeah, it's right there, this showing it. What's that? Yeah, I love this shot. This yeah, is I love amazing. it too. That's I mean, 1980. This was a really big show. I mean, this is probably the biggest show up to that date. There's a place called the Stardust Ballroom. It was on Sunset Boulevard, but on the eastern side of Sunset Boulevard. Which, um, and yeah, this is Des up there singing. And I mean, this was a peak moment as far as I'm concerned for Black Flag, or one of the peak moments. And, and the Circle Jerks were on this bill, and China White, and Fear. And uh, yeah, it was a great, great show. Some great shots in the book in this. I like the ones where you don't even see my flash go off, so you notice how really dark the whole place is. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's some photos in the book where it looks a little blurry, where my flash didn't go off. But I decided to use them just because they, you know, they're just beautiful shots in one way or another. But also, I was kind of amazed when I'm putting the thing together. I can't believe that I was able to focus in such dark places. You know, there was no automatic focus yet. You, I mean, and, and it's not that hard with a flash, but still, I mean, the places were really dark. You just couldn't see anything um, in, in many of the clubs, particularly in one in the book that was in Santa Barbara. And to see the pictures that we got from those uh, shows, it just, uh, yeah, it surprised me. I don't know, but this was, this, this is, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about this. this is a time long gone, and uh, yeah, this robo on the drums, and this, this was peak times. What I find very interesting about this, 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 this photo, Ooh. that photo there, was that these shows were super underground, so that's what I find so compelling, because it, it was still, I think people were able to gather in huge numbers, and it was sort of, like, not really... Well, that's when the police yeah. would come, too, right? right? They didn't know yeah. what was going on, and right. you'd have police shutting down all of Sunset Boulevard, you know, the main roads in, in, in Los Angeles, because they didn't know what the fuck was going on. All these guys with leather jackets, all these kids with, you know, a motorcycle boots on, and, and they were just scared, and that's why, you know... And the 1984 Olympics were coming, you know, and they wanted to keep this town clean. And to be fair, those kids were a bunch of more knuckleheads. Oh, that, that's yeah. for sure. Just, that's for sure. They, were, they, they, were, they did some stupid stuff. This yeah, photo yeah. is a really... Yeah, yeah, this, this, is, this, is my, this is one of my favorite photos ever made. I mean, and this is Henry's first show. And I just like this. I mean, I would have liked to put this on the cover of the book. And the picture that's on the cover is taken the same day. But, you know, it just didn't fit the format well. And everyone's seen it in my other books a lot. But, yeah, I mean, just the... I mean, this is Black Flag right here, and just plus the composition on top of it. And I was, I didn't really like shooting vertical photos that much because that's not how your eyes see. But at the same time, I was working for Skateboarders Action Now magazine, and to get a full page picture, you had to have it vertical, right? Otherwise, it would be cut in half, or and there was only one center spread in the magazine, and they wouldn't put a vertical photo very, you know, I'm, you know, if you shot it horizontal, they wouldn't put a music photo in the center there. So I did shoot vert uh, vertical, you know, portrait style photos a little more often just because of that. But it ended up being, yeah, one of my favorite photos of all time. I remember seeing this photo the first time and just thinking, this, this is so stupid. They, they're all making the dumbest faces, right? <laughs> and I always thought, like, this photo sucks, you know? And I remember calling him, I was like, they all look like a bunch of goofs, but then he's like, you're not seeing what's going on here. That is a pure, visceral moment. 
And I actually have grown to love this photo. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a minor threat photo that's somewhat similar to this, which is the same kind of thing. And I, and I first saw it, I was like, well, that's ridiculous looking because we're making dumb faces. But I think he's right. This photo is an incredible photo because they are, they are fully committed, like they're really in. Um, and you know, it's funny because when I showed you that other photo, the one mi there's a minor threat photo that equally is goofy. Yeah. And I think because of Ian's first reaction to this one, I didn't show it to him for years, for a really long time. And then one time I showed it to him, he's like, that's the greatest photo minor threat ever. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you really love it. You know, you just, our tastes change. Yeah. But it's a really powerful, yeah, it's a yeah, powerful shot. Yeah, I love this shot. one. This, this is incredible. I mean, I, you know, going through these photos is, is one thing. You know, I really, I think this works better when we ask you guys questions. We'll go through the photos a little bit more, but I'd rather, rather than us talking and just talking and talking. I'd rather answer questions more directly. So get your questions ready. Yeah, well, you have, yeah, but, ask but a we'll, question. We'll, yeah, yeah, well, you can ask a question right now. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go to the photos now. Who wants to ask a question? Let's go right there. So it better be good. For Glenn, just rewind a little bit and tell us the first time you ever heard about uh, Black Flag or your first introduction to Black Flag. Well, I don't want to sound like I'm on a talk show, but if you read the book, you would know that already. Um, so what happened is that I was, at a, I was at the Starwood, you know, which was a nightclub where you would see bands, and when the bands weren't playing, you know, some people would go to the bar, you go out outside, there was a big parking lot that was self-contained. It was really a great place to see shows, and they only had punk shows on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, because obviously that's the place that the rock people wouldn't necessarily be coming out. I mean, that's a similar club where, like, Van Halen broke their chops and stuff like that, but it was a small club, and then there was... Inside, in one of the other rooms, was a, which was like a disco floor, a dance floor, and Rodney Bingenheimer was in there. You know, Rodney is like the DJ of so much stuff. He found so many, he brought so much music to light over the years, and he was a 60s fixture and all that. So in Rodney's new wave disco, he was, I'm in there one day, uh, you know, in between other bands, I think the Alley Cats were playing in the crowd. These are all, you know, Huntington Beach band, and, and, uh, I don't, and I think the Alley Cats were also from Redondo or something like that. And, and so we go in there, and, we, and I hear this record that came on that it just sounded like all the equipment was broken, right? It's just like, it was so loud. It was such a weird sound. It was just so, it was so aggressive and abrasive to me at the time. Like, I had never heard anything like that. And, and I, you know, and I asked one of my friends who I was with at the time, I'm like, who the fuck is this? This is incredible. I mean, it's so dirty. And we're just getting into punk rock. You have, you know, it looks like it's a mostly older crowd, but, you know, younger people got to realize there was just no such thing before this stuff. There was nothing like it. There was nothing to compare it to. I mean, you know, I wasn't cool enough, and none of us really were cool enough to know about the Stooges or old enough when they came out, right? We learned about it after the fact. I, ne I heard the Stooges after Black Flag, right? But... So this record comes on and my friend tells me that's Black Flag. Oh, I've heard about them. I've seen the graffiti around town. I've seen the flyers. That's Black Flag. And that was the, you know, the first Nervous Breakdown single. And Rodney, of course, had it first. And I heard it there and I was just like, you know, and I wasn't, I was living back in New York, going to high school. Uh, my mom made us move back to live with my dad in New York. And so I didn't get to see them right then. But, you know, I made it a mission to find out more about them. And eventually next time I came out, you know, Ron was singing in the band. Keith was no longer in the band. I don't even think Keith was in the band once the first record came out. I'm not, Ian might know that. I don't think he was. But anyways, that's when I first heard about them. And of course, it was inspirational. It was exciting. You're a teenager and you're just like, this is the angst that I'm feeling. This is like something that's speaking to me. This is something that's so fucking incredible. I got to tell other people about it. And that's why I started making the pictures. Um, another question, then we'll talk about this picture. I like answering questions so much better. Oh, there's no questions? No hands up? Okay. Cynthia Conley. Uh, so, um, the photographs of Scarlet Ballroom, which I was at that show, I just noticed in the front row that the Beatles were quite a few people in the audience. Yeah. Is that possible? In that picture, I cannot. I swear to God, that woman is Sean Carey, the person who drew this. Like, oh, really? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't know that. And I, I, if I can go backwards, I would, but we could look at it in the book better. <laughs> Sean Carey is the, the <laughs> woman who. <laughs> Did she not, did a lot of flyers. She well, did no, the, but most famously, she did the Circle Jerks. The skanking, skanking guy, yeah. guy for the Circle Jerks. She's pretty... Um, she also did the Germs' very last flyer, which I think is equally as famous, but yeah. maybe that's because I was... Oh, it would be kind of cool to research that at some point. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> a question, anybody? I didn't mean that as a, you know. There you go. I'm asking you right there with the mask on, yeah. Oh, you got to get uh, John Davis. Oh, he's waiting for the microphone. 
Hello. Hello. Was there a person in the group that you found most interesting to photograph? And if that person was Henry, was then who besides Henry? Um, I mean, again, if you look at this book, it's like I found everyone interesting. The front man is just the front man, right? And right. I mean, and he's out there spilling his guts. The other guys, that's the interesting thing about Black Flag. They all spill their guts. That, and that's, I mean, they're intense. This book is heavy, right? And, you know, Dukowski was probably the next person because I also yeah. connected with him early on, you know. And, you know, Ginn was always a little bit distant, but they were all incredible. I mean, you, again, just look at the pictures of them and it'll tell you, I mean, they're, they're, they were just giving it all. They were, you know, not bleeding on stage, although Henry sometimes would, but I mean, just, you know, there's also, I don't know if I get to it in these pictures. You know, this is, you know, whatever, I could skip that picture now. Okay, this is great, this is a good example. This is a fucking rehearsal, okay? <laughs> and they're not just putting it on for me, this is how they do it. I'm the only one in the room besides the band and their roadie, right? And that's it, I mean, Black Flag, they would rehearse like six, eight hours a day sometimes. It was unfucking believable how hard they were, how serious they were, their work ethic. I have to say, both Ian and I were, in, I mean, you know, we're just young kids, we're 18, 19 years old and we're hearing Black Flag. And, and then when you meet them and you see how they work, like Ian was saying earlier, you know, with the phone numbers and the touring and how everything goes, you know, I learned how to send out press photos and how to do, you know, get your pictures published in different places from Black Flag, you know? I mean, it's part of probably the reason how I got my first album cover, you know? I was seeing the adolescents, I heard there's a rumor that they were playing, so I go in the record store and I just start looking, who's putting out, who's Frontier Records, what's that? And, you know, you see the address on the back, you get a phone number, you call them, you know? It's the fucking hustle, man. It's like, you know, DIY, do it yourself because you had to. You didn't have a fucking choice if you wanted to do something and get something done. You know, and again, look at these guys. I mean, they're inspiring me. The intensity, the integrity, it just, you know, the emotion, it was just getting to me. And I just thought, you know, I used to listen to, you know, rock bands like we all used to before there was a punk rock, you know, and this was so much more real to us, you know, and it was us, you know, a lot of the singers were our age. I'm like, this is incredible. Every, and, you know, and I had Skateboarder Magazine as a mouthpiece kind of, you know, I had this access to that, that they had, you know, at their peak before I was shooting punk pictures, but they had a million readers, you know, and if I was get the ear of the editor, you know, more people would find out about that. You know, Dukowski credited my photographs in Skateboarder and in Skateboarder's Action Now, which it developed into because skateboarding kind of couldn't afford a magazine anymore, um, as, you know, helping spread that seed of punk rock and of Black Flag, really, you know, around the world, because they had so many readers, and it was like, you know, it wasn't just a local fanzine, because, you know, certainly, even at this time, you know, when Black Flag's first album came out, it, uh, the, the full album was supposed to be distributed by a major label. Well, as soon as they heard it, they said, this is an anti-parent record, we can't do this, and the whole deal fell through, <laughs> right? And that was weird, because it obviously isn't what they said it was, but they were scared of it or whatever. Yeah, this guy, Chuck and Greg, went to jail over yeah, that, too. Yeah, the, the only, I, we, we wrote yeah. about that in the book, too. Yeah. And, uh, but not just briefly, the Stevie Chick's book really gets into the details yeah. of that. But yeah, what, what Ian's referring to is, well, that was later. later. Let me just finish this part of it. The, um, uh, what was I saying? So, oh, when that record came out and it got banned, I thought, well, this is newsworthy. And they taught me, you know, and what I knew is that we go to the newsstands and we write down the address, we open up a magazine and you see the address of the editorial offices. And we have, I had 20 envelopes on the ground from every major news outlet in the country, Time Magazine, Newsweek, Village Voice, Cream Magazine, whatever. And I would put black flag eight by tens in envelopes and send it to all of them thinking, okay, here's, we're gonna get some publicity out of this. This is what they wanted to spread the seed. You wanted people to know about black flag because they were changing your life. You mm -hmm. wanted them to change everyone else's life. And, I sent all those pictures out, and of course, no one wrote about it. No one cared. <laughs> they were all thrown away. It, nothing happened. Uh, not, even, not even the music magazines. The only time they finally wrote about Black Flag is when I think they liked the Minutemen, and they knew that Black Flag put them on, mm -hmm. and it was after Black Flag was already basically, basically uh, no longer a band I liked to listen to, mm. or was worth listening to, in my opinion. That's um, one thing I say about them. In terms of promotion with Black Flag, they were... I don't think there was any band that worked harder in terms of promoting their shows. They had a really intense flyer ethic. They would go wheat pasting. They would put up thousands and thousands of flyers everywhere. And Henry has told me, like, they would practice all day, and they come home, they have, like, they get back to, they were living 
at the label. Like Henry initially was sleeping under his desk, and they all lived in this weird little their office. It was a one room tiny one room yeah. office. Had a you know a shower in the back, but they they all lived together. Greg the, was he slept in the van outside, but they'd get back. They'd have like you know a can of SpaghettiOs or something. And then Greg would say, okay, go wheat paste. And then they would just go out all night long and just, you know, highway overpasses. They put their flyers everywhere. Many of I mean, most of them, which were um, Raymond Pettibon uh, uh, images, which were so provocative. I mean, I mean, they were really intense and, and they never stopped. They were always pushing like they really promoted themselves. It was pretty unrelenting. And uh, I think it, for all of us, like, I mean, we made flyers, but we didn't do that. Like we would never go like spend all day and all night going all over LA. I mean, of course we would not go to LA, but being here, but, um, but it was really impressive. It did it really inspire people. All right, well, we got to get the word out, you know? And, and it's I not think, that you know, it was, it's not like it was legal when you're wheat pasting stuff on poles, no, you know? No. no, and also they were at that point they hated, the cops hated black flags. So if you were like putting up black flag posters, there was a famous, um, there's a very famous one that was like a really profane <laughs> poster featuring a police officer. And, um, and uh, it was, uh, they put, were we pasting it. And I think, I forget who it was, but one of them got busted putting it up. And the cop, it's like, you know, it's a picture of a cop. And the guy was like, you know, you wanna talk about this? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I can tell you, I remember many years later, and Rollins was living in New York, and we were walking up Second Avenue, and these cops kind of stepped up and like, hey, excuse me, hold on. And I was like, oh shit, is this like payback for like all the black flag stuff? And the guy who says, come to Henry, says like, dude, can I get an autograph? And yeah. I was like, so, right. any questions? Times change. Questions? This guy right here with the red hat. I was just curious if you, there was any bands that blew your mind that you were never able to take pictures of, just never got the opportunity? Um, there were definitely a lot of bands I missed. A lot of people that I would have liked to have shot over the years. Um, you know, someone I got to meet just recently that was like definitely always in my top five um, was uh, Penelope Houston from the Avengers. I always wanted to shoot them back then, but when I met her finally just uh, last month, they, you know, they never played outside of San Francisco only a few times. And they were over by 1979. I think I took my first punk photo in 1980. So, you know, and, and there were other bands too. I remember, uh, you know, I used to see a lot of bands, you know, that I just, like I said, I just didn't have my camera gear there. And if, particularly if it was someone who had come from out of town and was only there once, eh, I fucked up, I lost them, you know. And there's certainly other times too when the camera didn't get, come through the camera properly, I mean the film. And, uh, but yeah, there, there's some bands, you know, uh, Di Kreutzen is what I was just thinking of. It's maybe a very active, very intense band, Seven Seconds, I never got to shoot. They were really, you know, uh, very active on stage. It would have been a cool band to shoot. But, you know, I think I shot most of the people that I wanted to, and I only shot people I wanted to for the most part. You know, I would keep my camera in the backpack when it was a band I didn't really care for. I, well, I, I, you know, you call, I don't like being called a documentarian. I, you know, I like to inspire people. But, you know, not even a photographer. It's, I mean, it's more of an art for me. And I, again, I do it to inspire people. I'm not doing it to fucking document your scene. It's <laughs> a question over question? here. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> you got to let people know, you know, where it's coming from. There's a lot of, you know, passion here. Over here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, hi. Um, so I have a question for the both of you. So my colleague and I are on the, you know, drug decrim, sex work decrim stuff here in D.C., so the harm reduction scene. And to this day, we meet so many people who kind of came into harm reduction and thinking about social issues in general from this aesthetic, visually and sonically, this political aesthetic that y'all were at the initial parts of. So, um, and today, when we do our nightlife tabling, to this day, young people coming into the scene, coming into their political consciousness, they still identify with these images, they still identify with these sounds. So I guess my question is, how do you both feel um, about this legacy of being what youth political consciousness looks like and sounds like to this day? I, I couldn't have imagined you know, 30, 40 years ago, the images that, you know, most of the most well-known images I made, I couldn't imagine that they would have held up over this time. I mean, this is like, I can't say it's a dream come true, but it's phenomenal, and I'm just so happy about it, and it's just like, it's incredible. I mean, it is, it's incredible. I mean, I'm sure Ian, he'll tell you, but how he feels about his work, too. You know, when we were, and again, even when I'm doing these books, 
You know, and, even, and particularly when I was shooting skateboard photo, photos and you look back at them, in the moment you're looking for something else to inspire people because most people are able to experience it firsthand. But when you look back at it 30 years later, it's like all of a sudden there's like 30 new photos that look fantastic because you're not worrying about some minuscule detail in the photograph that you're trying to tell that night, like it was at the Starwood or this guy's doing an aerial and he's not getting really high out of the pool. It doesn't matter anymore. You look back at it and it's still beautiful and it's composed well and it's a beautiful photograph and it's gonna inspire people for the original reasons we wanted, to, wanted it to and maybe it didn't even do it back then. And the fact that it speaks to kids now, that's the best. That's why I do the books. I, you know, I would say, I, you know, I was thinking about, I was <clears throat> thinking about this talk because um, I forgot who I was actually speaking with. But I said, you know, like, you know, I'm, we're both 60 years old now, right? So it's like, you know, I was like, who wants to? <laughs> just woke up. That's all I did. Um, <laughs> uh, you it's all we got to do every day. Yeah, really. word. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, like, like 60 year olds, like, you know, like I remember once seeing Woodstock, which is a movie I was very obsessed with when I was a kid. And I was watching, the movie came on. There was a guy next to me, this is the old Biograph Theater on M Street. And this guy, as soon as the movie started, this guy whipped out these tickets. He was like, I was there, I was there. And I was like, fuck. You know, you know, and because it just, it seemed like something else must have happened for him at some point, but and I feel like there's a point of it where I feel like, well, it's just like dudes in their 60s flapping their gums about something that happened a long time. It, there's something about it that makes me, like, I feel partially, I feel like, well, who wants to hear that? Like, you know, who just wants that? It just seems at some point, seems a little ridiculous in a way, you know, but like, I think the photos stand for themselves as, doc as documents, whether you're a documentarian or not, um, but as documents, they're, they're powerful. But I, what I will say is that the American punk underground, um, especially, and I think punk in general, it was, a, it was truly a, a rebellion, like a, a, a cultural rebellion. And, um, and it, it's so, in many ways, the way, what, the way it was working was so underground, it, you can't compare it to what a lot of what people you would read about in punk. Now, I know there's underground punk stuff happening now, that, or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter whether it's called punk or not. But to me, that chain, um, blues, jazz, beat, uh, uh, rock and roll, uh, hip hop, punk, it's all basically one thing. It's the new idea, right? It's always the new idea that it can, it's, 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 it's coming out of people, this form of expression, um, uh, without it being, dict without profit motives dictating, without the business controlling it. And this particular scene was so visceral and so um, active and so repellent to the industry that it was almost like, wow, we could really grow something here. Because they, I'll tell you right now, the major labels and major media despised punk pretty much straight through until Nirvana came along. And when that's when they smelled the money. Really, that was it. Like before that, like a couple bands would sign, but by and large. And you know, and even when you look at all these documentaries that still come out, they go from yeah. the Sex Pistols who were on a major label to right. Nirvana, right. Hell, and you know, maybe the Clash is in there, the Ramones or something, but you know, they skip so much vital stuff. They might get a mention of Minor Threat or Black Flag, like one word, like even by mention. And if that, and it still happens to this day, it's really disappointing. So, but, you know. so my point, so what I was gonna say was that, that what this was was actually an organic, creative, like people say like, what wasn't like, weren't people fighting and wasn't there like some depravity and weren't people doing this and that? Yeah, there was some of that going on, you know? But you know what? There's some of that going on down the Capital One Arena, you know, and there's some of that going on at every fucking bar and on every street, right? It's called life. That's what happens. But why were people, like, if that was the case, if there was depravity, why were people so committed? Why were so many people on, going on the road, driving, dealing with this, like, crazy stuff? Because we were construction workers. Because we wanted to make something could it meant something. That's what, we wanted to make our own world. We didn't want to smash a state, we wanted to build our own fucking state. That's my answer. We have time for a couple more questions, but if you want to get through the photos, you should. Oh, okay, that, yeah. we, we don't have to get through the photos, they'll get the book. This is another great shot of Henry. And you don't even yeah. have to do that. There's many more photos in the book. Yeah. 
Oh, that's the Suicide so, Tendency. Yeah. By this point, I was managing a band and I produced their first record, and that record didn't come out yet, and I wanted to get everyone together. And I thought by having Black Flag play a party, because they would play anywhere. They just wanted to rehearse, they wanted to play. And so I wanted to get as many of these suicidal kids together in one spot. Just to clarify, Suicidal Tendency was a band. I don't think they... Oh, okay, I apologize. Yeah, Not yeah. suicidal kids. <laughs> suicidal Tendency was with a band, and these are fans of the band Suicidal Tendencies. Exactly, okay. He didn't want to get a bunch of suicidal kids together. <laughs> yeah. that, was not what he was trying to, that was not what he was trying to do. <laughs> and so anyways, we, you know, we thought putting Black Flag on the bill was going to help get all these kids, even though it was like a private party for suicidal tendencies and for their fans. And, um, and Black Flag, of course, as usual, just poured their guts out. And this, the suicidal tendencies fans, kids, didn't really love Black Flag that much. They liked them, I think. They, and there's video that exists of this show. Al Flipside from Flipside Magazine made video of it. They taped like four songs. And I was using, and there was daylight, as you can see, coming through the light in some of the other pictures. But then I would put down my camera and I'd be slamming in there with everyone else just Really, it was like a private show. There's only 20 people behind me when I'm taking this picture. But it was really, really, it was a great, it was a great, great moment. It was the last time Des ever played in the band, actually, too. And for them, it was just, it was, a, it was a, you know, a challenge to play in front of these kids who really, most of them didn't even know, you know, they didn't really care that it was Black Flag. They just wanted to see, they were all from the west side of Los Angeles, and they were almost like a gang. Uh, and in they fact, were some of gang. them were a gang. Yeah. They weren't like uh, a gang. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know. And yeah, and, and we had this show and, and we got these intense photos. It was pretty great. And uh, let's see what else. Oh, and this is Black Flag's, this is the very last show I shot of Black Flag. Uh, this was uh, July 4th, 1983, I think, or what, yeah. 83. It might have been 84, I think it was 83. And it was the, yeah, the very last time I shot them. And it was also Chuck Dukowski's last time he played in the band. And for me, that was a real, you know, already the musical direction. I wasn't feeling it. I wasn't really liking the, you know, they, there, there was something, I think, I can't speak for the band, but some people, you know, I think they, there was something they were, they were trying to be too antagonistic towards the audience. They thought the, a lot of the audience was becoming, conforming to a new thing, a new kind of thing that was punk, and punk had to be a certain way. So they didn't really like that, or maybe they just wanted to play a different kind of music. I don't know what they did, but I wasn't feeling it like I was. I, it just, it wasn't speaking to me. And so this was the last show that I photographed of them, and, and also with Dukowski, who I really thought was kind of the heart and soul of the band. He might not have been the leader or the you know, brain of the band necessarily who started the whole thing, but Dukowski was, he, he was a good friend of mine and he was a lot of the heart and he still worked for them for years afterwards. Mm -hmm. But when he was out of the band, it just felt different to me and that was the last time I shot them live. And that's why we end on that photo, but you know, we still are here to answer some questions. Yeah. So, sorry, I got a mic. Oh yeah, there you are. Apologize. Um, this, is, this is less about Black Flag and more about you, Glenn, but um, your imagery has, I mean, I grew up with it. It's amazing. Thank you. But um, how did you get yourself in that place? Like, I can think of multiple images where I'm like, I don't understand how you were there. It's amazing. It's incredible. And so also for the few young people in the audience, like, Maybe you can give them advice on how to be in that place. Well, I was in those places because I had passion for the subjects. It's what I believed in. It's what I loved. It was what was driving me as a teenager. It's like keeping you alive, right? It's like it's giving you something. And, you know, I was lucky to be around at these times when there were these things developing that really were inspiring me. You know, and again, I just wanted to share it with other people. And I'm just, you know... I don't know if, you know, I'm just a little bit intense person. I just like to get into things, you know, and, and, and I'm in it. I'm not, you know, I'm straight edge before there was a thing as straight edge. You know, I'm, I was a skateboarder. I was into punk rock. I'm not a fucking voyeur. I'm not just there documenting a scene, just being, you know, some other person just thinking it's some weird, interesting thing. This is my life. And the subjects, quite honestly, deserve the respect that I think I'm giving them in the photos because they're inspiring me to take those photos. So, you know, and again, I just felt very passionate about the subjects and I was a part of them even when I got into hip hop. I loved it. I just thought it was incredible. You know, punk rock at the time that I got into hip hop was kind of, you know, it was changing its direction. It was kind of going down a little bit. It's become, there's a lot of, you know, generic punk rock. People were playing, you know, 
what they were. And, and hip hop to me was just like the next version of that in a way. It was much, it was dynamic, it was interesting. It was like black kids version of punk rock, you know, is what I thought at the time. And, and thanks to the Beastie Boys, I was able to have entree into that scene and meet those guys, you know. I mean, I knew the Beasties as a punk rock band and I never photographed them because I didn't care for them as a punk rock band. <laughs> but as a hip hop band, you know, they were, you know, they were really, it was inspiring to me and even to Ian. I remember when we first heard them, we're like, we're like into hip hop and Ian is into go-go, of course. And then we hear like these guys that we know and they're doing it and like, holy shit. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is a new, like, oh, we can do this too moment. I think we might've even written some rhymes together or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't want to admit that. That but never it, fucking happened. No. No, you, you remember when the movie, uh, um, when Style Wars came out? I remember the We were very inspired by that, oh, and I'll okay. leave it at that. All right. Okay. Okay, one, one more question on this side, and one on that side. Yeah. Wait, where, where, where? Oh, right here? Okay, sure, yeah. Ian, I don't know if you remember, but I spoke with you over the phone a while back, so, like, I've been freaking out this entire time sitting here listening to you talk about all of this, like, in person. Uh -huh. But Glenn... I'm a photo student who's hoping to do my thesis on the DIY scene, and I'm just wondering if you have any advice on how um, you built relationships with these bands and like built that trust. Because I know sometimes with photographers, especially today, as I've tried to like document the scene and introduce myself to bands, it's like it's harder to build that trust now. Um, so if you have any advice, I'd love to hear it. It's definitely a different era, and everyone can take a picture now. And even people who don't know how to take pictures should get a good one every once in a while just because the technology is so advanced. Um, mm -hmm. I think I got to be friends with a lot of those people because they saw my work, like Ian. They knew it before. My work spoke for itself. If I was there, and not everyone know it, you know, certainly a lot of people didn't know me. You know, he did because he was a skateboarder. But they see you work a certain way. They know that you care and that you're getting in positions and putting yourself places. Like when I was a skateboarder and I'm getting in the pool and where no one else would, and I'm getting really close to someone where you can get killed, but you're gonna get a good shot. They know that you're kind of participating as much as they are. They know that you fucking mean it. And if you have heart and the people see that and you've got a vision and it's important to you, then that's just what you gotta keep on trying to do. If it's not important to you, if you're just doing it because you wanna have a picture for Instagram or something like that, then I have no advice for anyone who wants to do that. I have advice for people who really care and it's their life depends on it and it's their passion and it's their art. You know, not something you want to document to get known or to make money or anything like that. If you're lucky, later on, maybe you can do those things, but it has to come from here first, you know. And back, this, relating to what this one guy said, it relates to one question, we'll go to another one, but I just wanted to be clear, you know, you know, people often still say, well, why don't you just shoot this band? Why don't you shoot any more and stuff like that? It's like, that was my period when I was inspired and when I was young and I was going to shows. And I really feel so like if there's a new young band out there, I thought it was really weird and creepy when there were guys older than the bands taking pictures or women or anyone. <laughs> I just thought it was, photographers, it was a very creepy thing in a way. That's again why I didn't want to carry my camera with me all the time. It was just, I didn't want to be known as a photographer, you know? And so, you know, let your generation, let your peers shoot pictures of you. You shoot pictures of your peers, I'll shoot them of mine if I want to, if they're still doing things that inspire me. Otherwise, it's like, I feel like I've done enough, I've done a lot of that stuff, let's work on other things now. You know, but as long as you care about it, just keep showing that and hopefully the work will come through. Uh, it's, this, is, uh, this is a question for both of you, but it started, um, Ian, uh, a story that your brother told me. Um, about, this has to do with Black Flag, so the, the role that Spot played in the rise of Black Flag, he said Spot would come out before shows and get say the, say you the guys pumped again? up. Sorry, say the last, I couldn't hear the last thing you said. Oh, Spot would come out before shows and get you guys pumped up, and he oh. would do this in city to city, um, but specifically in D.C., uh, the, the night before a New York show, he came out and said, who's going to New York? And you guys go, we are. And when you get to, and he goes, well, how do we feel about New York? And you guys go, fuck New York. <laughs> but you guys, he, his role in like, sp I guess, spreading the popularity of, the, of the, the band because every show he would do this and every show was crazy. So I just wanted to know if you guys could speak more Spot, on... Uh, I, it's funny, Spot 
was the, uh, he was the sound man. He was an engineer, and he recorded all the early Black Flag stuff. He worked on right on through, right through my work, maybe up to, maybe even like Slip It In or those later records. Um, but he was doing all the recording. Um, and he's also a brilliant, genius photographer. If you ask me, I think he's amazing. His book is incredible, too. Um, but Spot would also tour with them, and he was their sound man up front of house. Um, my brother made reversing a little bit. We went to New York to see them. The first time we saw them was in New York. We drove up to see them. But I do remember he was really, he was always like, we'd just get in, like, yeah, yeah, let's, you know, let's make this a great night. I remember being in the bathroom up at the Peppermint Lounge with um, Spot and uh, Mugger, who was our roadie, and they're like, you know, you know, let's fuck, let's make it this crazy night. Let's, you know, we're, we were so excited. You know, it was also, we'd seen Spot's name everywhere, you know, and he was quite a, quite a genius, that guy. And, he's a really nice guy, too. Yeah. Um, he's living in Sheboygan, Wisconsin now, actually. Sheboygan, yeah. Um, but um, he, and he's also, another thing about Spot, which is interesting, is that he is an absolutely genius guitar player. Um, he can play banjo, any string instrument, and clarinet. Um, There's pictures of him playing the clarinet at that suicidal tendency show. In the, that's right. He, he's actually there on the side of Black Flag playing them. So I would say that Spot was, um, you know, I toured with Black Flag in 1981, December of 81. I went to England with them and Spot was their, uh, their sound person on that trip. And uh, I did a lot of time with him. He's crazy. He's a crazy guy. But he's a really, he's a sweet dude. And um, I would say he played, he there was a part of the, that original Black Flag thing. It all, of course, it all fell apart, right? You know, things got really unpleasant with them later on. But in the beginning, he was really fused into their, their, their scene. And um, I think he, he was, he's such an approachable, nice guy. You know, the other guys, I mean, Greg, the guitar player, was always a little loof. And his nickname was Lurch. Yeah, they call him Lurch. <laughs> and he was, he's odd. And Dukowski is very intense. Like Glenn, Dukowski was really the heart and soul of the band for me, the bass player. He was just so incredible. And Robo, the drummer in the early days, he was from Colombia. Um, and the rumor was that he had killed some people in Colombia and then he'd swum to America. I don't know where. <laughs> um, but nobody knew where he was. Nobody really knew his story and we were all fascinated by it. And then um, we went to England together, and then when we flew back to America, Robo couldn't get in the country because it turned out he really wasn't supposed to be here. Like he, so he ended up going to Canada, and then he snuck across the border, but at that point, I think they got Billy um, Stevenson. Well, Bill Stevenson, who was a good friend of yeah, theirs. Yeah, yeah good guy. Um, anyway, Black Flag story. You should read, there's a book called Spray, spray Paint Spray Paint the Walls yeah. by a guy named Stevie Chick. It's called Spray Paint, yeah. What's that? Is it spray paint the wall? I think it's just spray paint. Is it spray paint the I walls? Think spray paint the walls. Yeah, it's great. Um, and it's weird. It's a British guy writing it, so it's a tonally a little bit weird. One thing he does throughout the book, which I find really weird, is he refers to him as the flag, which uh -huh. nobody ever called him the flag. You might have said flag, but he goes like, then the flag did this, and the flag did that. And you can almost hear the British accent. But the, um, but it's a, it's actually a pretty pretty good book. And it, no, I think it's good. Yeah, I it mentioned really, it. Yeah. yeah, I mentioned in my book. I mean, I did yeah. the cover of it. It's that picture of Henry from the... Uh, but if you want to get a sense of what was the kind of, what was happening with that band, that's a pretty interesting book to look at. Um, I just want to say something about oh, yeah. Spot. Oh, yeah. Spot was a roller skater and a skateboarder. Yeah. And he recognized me at that first Black Flag show when I met them that night. He introduced me to Chuck Dukowski. He's a man. He's a really nice guy. Really yeah. cool. Question. We got to wrap up. Oh, we're so right. oh. What about Jim Saw? We're, okay, Jim's got a question. Oh, we need him. Did he? Or were you just saying hello to him? You no, know, he wanted to hear the oh, question. Okay, yeah, let's hear it, Jim. How are you doing? Well, I was just going to say that I was just wondering if L.A. had a similar, like you had SST and stuff, and we had Discord, but I don't, I, Discord was more than a label. It's this, like, nucleus that just everything kind of inspiring spun around and stuff, and, and it's continued, you know, to this day. I do consider myself like a, a documentarian, in, not in a way that it, I feel like I was inspired to document it. I wasn't, it, it, you know, I, I wasn't just documenting it because it was there. It's like Ian said something to me when he helped me with my book. He said that you should only put pictures in it that you that you had to take, you know, and and it was in re reference to the Beastie Boys. I wanted to put some. 
Beastie Boys, the show I was at with you at the Madison Square Garden. We both shot that show in 90 something, their return to Madison Square Garden. And I uh, was gonna put a few photos from them in there. And he was like, why are you putting these in there? And I'm like, oh, Beastie Boys are a good band, they're good photos. And he's like, why did you shoot those? And I was like, oh, well, NME hired me to shoot them. And he's yeah. like, oh, it was a gig then. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, no, it's the ones like you needed to. I agree 100%. Yeah, and that's why they're not in the book. And, 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 uh, Plus, it's at Madison Square Garden. How good can they be? <laughs> well, I'm just I mean, Jim shoots pictures in nightclubs, too. He knows. You get close to stuff. It makes all the difference in the world. On a nightclub, on a big... You could shoot good pictures on a big stage, but you're not close up. It's not heartfelt, yeah, as you, usually. My, I guess my question is, is we had uh, this scene that still exists, and, and we still have love and respect and we all inspire one another and I'm just wondering if you had that in, in the LA scene. Absolutely not. <laughs> Doesn't have that there. No. I mean SST was kind of a cult at some point and it was really kind of and that's when I realized it was that it's kind of when I moved away from it. You know when all of a sudden one of the bands that was on their label got signed by a major label and yesterday they were their favorite band in the world and now they suck just because they got signed. And that, you know, you see, you know, things happen like that. And particularly, I think the California and Los Angeles culture is kind of, it's a different thing. I mean, I think I was introduced as from Los Angeles. I lived there for about 10 years. I've lived in New York for 35 years. I'm not from Los Angeles. I'm, you know, an East Coast person. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, and there were labels like Frontier. There was labels like Posh Boy. There was a lot of great bomb early, you know, and of course all the major labels are there, right? And, and there was a little bit of independent stuff, Frontier being my favorite because Lisa Fancher, um, but I, there was nothing like, there's nothing like Discord as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you had maybe Touch and Go for a little while with something similar. I, Ian would know better. I don't know that much about independent labels, but I have never seen anything from the first time I came to D.C. to the last time I came to D.C. It's like there's nothing like what he's built here. Yeah. We, we built. That's a good note to go out on. Let's thank Glenn and Ian again for their work. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. I just want to say, um, David, also, I just want to say thanks, of course, to the library staff and to the punk and go-go archive work that's been done here, which I think is incredible, and we should all support, um, and to the library for having us here. Very nice. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you David. So uh, Glenn has some time to sign some books, which we'll do up where you were buying. Um, Solid State is still up there signing, uh, selling books. Um, thanks to Solid State and to the DC Public Library Foundation for supporting this event. Thank you.